We will now begin the today's webinar, Treatment for TB in the Case of Resistance, offered to you by the Kentucky TB Prevention and Control Program and the Southeastern National TB Center. To provide information and introduction of the speaker, we will now turn to Julia Moore, TB Nurse Educator for Kentucky Department for Public Health. Please go ahead. Welcome, everybody. Um, once again today, we are going to be joined uh, by healthcare professionals from across Kentucky and also our neighboring states, and we welcome everyone on this webinar. Our presentation today, uh, Treatment of TB Disease in the Case of Resistance, will be presented for us by Jerry Jean Stanbaugh, Director of Pharmacy for the A.G. Holly TB Hospital in Lantana, Florida, and Jerry Jean, uh, we really appreciate you taking your time to do these presentations for us, and also we want to thank um, Donna Setzer and SNTC for coordinating these training events for us. This is the second part of a two-part series on the treatment of TB disease. If you were unable to view the first webinar, the treatment of TB disease first-line therapy, it is now archived on the Southeastern National TB Center website under the archived webinars. And the webinar today will also be archived and posted about four to six weeks after today's presentation. Um, you can visit their website to see other wonderful webinars as well. Um, before we begin, I just want to clarify a couple of things. Several people have asked about the certificates and continuing education credits from the first webinar. I want to say that it usually takes about eight weeks after the presentation for these to be processed. So we are very near to that mark right now, so we should be expecting those in the very near future. Um, and then today's webinar, of course, was approved for 1.5 nursing credit. So uh, remember that following today's presentation, you will be sent a link um, with the evaluation uh, for you to complete. Uh, if you are viewing this with other persons in your office, you will have a link that you need to forward then to um, the others because each person will need to uh, complete the evaluation in order to receive their credit. We also would encourage anyone, even if you are not seeking the continuing education, to complete that evaluation because we do value everyone's feedback. At the end, and he's already explained, there will be question and answers. Um, session at the end. You can type your question in through live meeting or you will be prompted as to how to um, place your phone call um, with your question. And without any other further comments, I will turn this over to Jerry Jean. And again, I welcome everyone and I thank you, Jerry Jean, for um, presenting this wonderful webinar for us. Thank you for inviting me and uh, I am happy to be here talking to you again today. Of course. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So I need to be able, Donna. I need to be able to change the slide. There we go. Okay. So I have no financial affiliations, unfortunately, with any drug companies. Uh, I will be discussing two or three drugs that are not currently approved by FDA for use in tuberculosis, uh, although they are approved for other uses, and I will identify those drugs at the time we get to them. Guys, it, they are not changing. Okay. So last time we talked about first-line drugs, isoniazid, rifampin, the two newer rifamycins, ripabutin and rifapentine, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide. So today we are going to talk about second-line drugs. And hold on a second. We're having some, I'm having some difficulties. Okay, there we go, got it now. Second line drugs, which include ethionamide, paraminosalicylic acid, also known as PASS, cycloserine, canamycin, capriomycin, streptomycin, which was formerly a first line drug, but has now been moved to second line, and quinolone, such as levofloxacin. We're going to start out with uh, 
talking about a few definitions so that we're all on the same page. Um, there will be additional drugs that we're talking about, and as I mentioned, they are not approved for TB, and those would be Augmentin, which is amoxicillin clavulinate, clofazamine, some of the carbapenems such as Pimax and Merum, and then linezolid. Guys, I'm still having trouble changing slides here. Okay, what's the difference of the first line versus second line? The first line drugs are less toxic. They are better tolerated by patients. We have a lot more experience with their use. They are more efficacious. And as a general rule, they also uh, cost less than the second line drugs. So efficacy is considered bactericidal or bacterial static. Bactericidal is what we want our drugs to do. They have the ability to kill the organism outright without any help from the patient's immune system. And as you all are well aware, our patients don't have great immune systems, or they probably would not have come down with active tuberculosis. So the drugs that we have that are bactericidal are mostly the first-line drugs, INH, the rifamycins, pyrazinamide, the aminoglycosides, such as streptomycin, amicase, and canamycin, <clears throat> as well as capriomycin. Epambutol in high doses, like twice weekly doses that we use at 50 mg per kilogram, is bactericidal. However, the daily dose that we use tends to be bacteriostatic. The quinolones, which would be like levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, are bactericidal. Clofazamine is arguably bactericidal. And then a drug that is not approved for TB, linezolid, uh, is also bactericidal. So the other side would be bacteriostatic agents. And the bacteriostatic agents, for the most part, are our second-line drugs. So the low dose of the pambutol, PASS, paraminosalicylic acid, ethionamide, and cycloserine. When we're measuring how effective a drug is, we talk about MICs, MBCs, and MIC is a minimal inhibitory concentration. That's the lowest concentration of the drug that will inhibit the growth of the organism. So that is a bacterial static dose. That's the minimum amount you need in order to be efficacious. MBC, which we don't see used as often as the MIC ratings, is minimal bacterial cytokine concentration which would then be the lowest concentration of drug that actually kills the organism. We also have something in TB called critical concentration, which drives most of us absolutely crazy because it really uh, is not a good criteria to use. But a critical concentration is the lowest concentration that inhibited the growth of 99% of 100 different wild strains of tuberculosis. So when they test in the lab for whether or not a organism is effective, is, I'm sorry, is sensitive to a drug, in TB we check critical concentration. In every other disease known to man, they talk about MICs and MBCs. So critical concentrations, they just set certain concentrations that they test the growth against and don't do it on a continuum of different levels as you would do when you're doing an MIC. In addition, in an MIC, you are determining the MIC for the individual patient. In critical concentrations, we don't do that. We're testing our drugs at certain specified concentrations, and those are the only concentrations that are tested. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So sensitivity is the ability of a drug to kill or inhibit an organism at concentrations that we can achieve in the plasma without undue toxicity to the host. And we describe that in terms of MIC. Resistance, then, is the opposite. It's an increased need for higher plasma levels of drug to kill or inhibit, and we describe it in terms of an increasing MIC. National Jewish Center in Denver, Colorado, a number of years ago, came out with a schema 
for determining whether or not organisms were sensitive or resistant to our various drugs. So they said that if INH at a concentration of 0.1 micrograms per milliliter was sufficient to inhibit the growth of the TB, we would call that organism sensitive. But if it took more than four micrograms per milliliter to inhibit the growth, that sample would then be considered to be resistant. They did the same thing with rifampinus, ambutol, and streptomycin. So acquisition of resistant TB. How do we get resistant TB? We can have primary resistance, which is a resistance that occurs before you ever, the organism ever sees the first drug. And then we have something called secondary resistance. So primary resistance just occurs in nature through random reproduction of the organism. And with streptomycin, it occurs in about 1 in 10 to the fifth or 1 in 10,000 times that the mycobacterium regenerates itself, you will develop a resistant organism. With isoniazid, it's about 1 in 100,000. And same for Zambutol. Rifampin is about 1 in 10 million. So what would be the likelihood that occurring in nature that you would have resistance to both INH and rifampin, or MDRTB? Well, you would add those numbers together, those log numbers, and 10 to the 6 plus 10 to the 8 would make one organism in 10 to the 14th has a chance of becoming resistant to both INH and rifampin randomly in nature. I have no idea what that number is, but it's a very, very large number, and it's actually greater than the number that you would normally have in a very severe case of TB. Secondary resistance is then resistance that is created during treatment. It's something that we do ourselves, and that can happen in a number of different ways. The most common, whoops, I flipped the slide here, so let's go back to this one. We have identified certain genes involved in TB drug resistance. Now, there are probably many other genes that are involved in some of these, and some that may change it completely or may modify the effect of changes in these particular genes. So for instance, in isoniazid, if you have a mutation in the INHA gene, then you will get low-level resistance to INH. But if you have a modification of the CAT-G gene, then you will get high level of resistance to INH. For rifampin, we have identified the primary gene responsible for drug resistance as the RPOB gene. And we now have genetic probes that we can very quickly, in a matter of 24, 48 hours, test a set of sub, excuse me, can test a sample to determine whether or not it is resistant to INH and rifampin. There are other probes that will be coming out that will probably address these other drugs as well. So resistance can be partial. Like for INH, as I mentioned, if you have resistance or changes in the INH A gene, you get low-level resistance. And you can usually overcome that resistance by increasing the dose of INH. For example, instead of giving 300 milligrams once a day, if you increase that dose to 900 milligrams two or three times a week, you may be able to overcome that low-level resistance. The same type of thing can occur with the Sambutol and Streptomycin. However, with Rifampin, any resistance that occurs is total resistance, and we're not able to overcome that by increasing the dose. This is a study that was done in New York City in 1991. And what they did is they looked at their inner city TB clinics and they identified all the new patients walking in the door, first time being treated for TB, never been treated before. And they found out that in those brand new patients, 8.2% of them were already resistant to INH. And 3.5% were resistant to rifampin. Then they looked at all the patients that came back into their clinics after having been previously treated. They were either treated and disappeared before they completed treatment, or they relapsed at the, after the following up uh, period of treatment. So they had seen these drugs before. And at that point, 
21.5% of those retreated patients were resistant to INH, and 9% were resistant to rifampin. This is a study that made CDC look at the requirements for directly observed therapy because it became so obvious that we needed to cure these patients the first time around. So here are some definitions, just so that we're all on the same page here. Multidrug resistance, resistance to INH and rifampin specifically. So if you were resistant to INH and streptomycin and sensitive to rifampin, you may be resistant to multiple drugs, but you are not by definition multidrug resistant. XDR, or extensive drug resistance, is resistance to INH and rifampin, plus one of the quinolones, plus at least one of the injectable drugs other than streptomycin. So that would be canamycin, amikacin, or campiomycin. Then we have a third category of resistance that we haven't totally agreed on the terminology or the name for it. It's been called CDR for complete drug resistance, TDR for total drug resistance, and even XDR for extremely extensive drug resistance. So there hasn't been agreed upon term for it, but today we're going to call it TDR, or total drug resistance, where they are resistant to all of the standard TB drugs. So treatment of MDR, XDR, and TDR. It means that we can no longer treat for six-month therapy. Remember, in order to have a six-month therapy, you have to use both rifampin and PZA. So if you're MDR, XDR, or TDR, you are resistant to rifampin and therefore not eligible for six-month therapy. So we have to extend that therapy to 18 to 24 months, and it should be at least 18 months post-culture conversion to negative. And they also recommend six months of an injectable drug post-conversion. And we need to treat with at least four to six drugs to which the patient is sensitive. But we have a fully sensitive, pan-sensitive patient, we can get by with treating with two to three drugs to which that patient is sensitive. But when we get into these having to use second-line drugs, we have to use more drugs because those drugs are less effective. Okay. So let's go over a case. This is a case that we had here at H.E. Holly back in 2007 and 8. The patient is a 20-year-old Hispanic male from Peru. He entered the U.S. in April of 2007, and the patient claims in September of 2007 he developed fevers, a productive cough, and a 10-pound weight loss. The patient was hospitalized at a local hospital in Florida from October 13th to November 27th of that year. After he developed hemoptysis and told hospital staff he had been coughing two weeks, this is amazing. He was placed in an airborne infection isolation room within 20 minutes of entering the ER. You know, the cases we generally see are the ones that have been on the floor of the hospital for three or four days, and then they discover they have TB and put them in isolation. But within 20 minutes of hitting the emergency room, this patient was fortunately put into isolation. He is HIV negative. His chest X-ray on 1013 was abnormal with bilateral infiltrates, mostly right upper lung, and four centimeter cavity in the right upper lung. Here is his chest X-ray, and uh, so I know that's difficult to see. Let's see, we've got some better shots here. There you can see in the right upper lung. There it is again. So the patient denied any previous history of TB or have, having been treated for TB in the past. The patient denies knowing anybody with TB. He is from Lima, Peru, and he came to the U.S. as a student to learn English. And he was in a large high school in an English as second language class from January to May of 2007. So this was three months before he claimed he had symptoms. The patient was initially smear negative, so bronchoscopy. Bronchoscopy was performed on October 16th. 
There were no endobronchial lesions, friable mucosa, no clear site of bleeding. The bronchial wash and brushings were AFB positive. The health department was notified on October 19th by the local hospital. And I realize that this is hard to read here, but this is just a list of the, of the uh, smears and cultures that were grown from the hospital. Initially, back on 1014, he was smear negative, but with a light growth, then it became moderate. And then we had moderate uh, smears with heavy growth. And then gradually, over time, it started decreasing until eventually uh, he became smear negative. Now, initially, although he was AFB smear negative, there was a positive culture. And given the chest of x-rays and CT findings, the patient was started on four-drug initial regimen of RIPE on October 13th. He was discharged from the hospital on November 27th, still smear positive, but with decreased numbers of organisms and clinically responding. They kept him there uh, for an extended period of time beyond which they normally would have kept him because there were small children in the household and they wanted them to be evaluated and started on INH as well as to assure the patient was less contagious. So a patient wanted to fly home to Peru, but because he was culture positive, uh, he was discouraged from doing that. And then on 12-19, the health department received information from that the patient was resistant to INH, rifampin, bisambutol, and streptomycin with PCA sensitivities pending. After discussions, the decision to admit the patient to our hospital was made and the patient and his family eventually agreed to that. And the patient was admitted to A.G. Holly on December 21st of 2007. So what treatment do I give him now? He's resistant to the four first-line drugs of three and possibly the PCA, so now what are you going to use to treat him? So here's our polling questions, and uh, operator, do you want to give them instructions on how to vote on this? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to register for a question or place your vote, please press 1-4 on your telephone keypad. 1-4. Thank you. Okay. So first choice is keep him on the same regimen, RIPE, pending confirmation labs. Your second choice is to stop all meds and await confirmation labs. Or you could keep him on the same regimen, regimen and add a quinolone, ethionamide, and pass. Stop all meds and start a quinolone, streptomycin, and pass, or ship him home to Peru and let them worry about it. Okay, so looks like most of you are going to quinolone, streptomycin, and pass. Okay, so what did we do? One of the things you do want to do is you want to confirm the resistance. If you did something that's resistant like this, you want to, to repeat that culture on more than one specimen. Could have been a lab error, and you don't want that to be the cause of treating a patient with potentially toxic drugs for a long period of time. So make sure that you confirm that those sensitivities are real. So once the patient was started at AGH, we started him on INH 900 twice a week. So remember I said that if it's low-level resistance to INH, then you can use a higher dose to overcome it. But any level of resistance is still considered to be resistance, and you don't count that drug as an active drug. If Zambutal, to which he was also resistant, we increased to 2.4 grams twice a week. Again, same rationale. We kept his PZA at 1,500 milligrams daily, which was his dose prior to getting those, those resistances because we didn't have a result on PCA yet. It takes longer, it's done by a different mechanism, and it takes longer to get those results back. Now we switched him from rifampin to rifibutin. Now there are both rifamycins, 
but about 5% of the time when a patient has resistance to rifampin, they may still be sensitive to rifibutin. So keeping our fingers crossed, we switched them to rifibutin at 300 milligrams per day. Then we added a quinolone, moxifloxacin, 800 milligrams per day, cyclosamine, 250 per day. We placed him on imipenem or Primaxin, 1,500 milligrams IV every 12 hours. We added capiomycin, 1 gram IV three times a week, and we increased the vitamin B6 to 200 milligrams per day, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. But you want to add at least two drugs that the patient has never seen and to which they're not showing to be resistant. So at this point, with initial sensitivities, we have moxie, cycloserine, Primax, and, and Caprio, to which, at this point, we believe him to be sensitive. So usually you want to have, make one of those drugs an aminoglycoside, which we did with capriomycin, and a quinolone, which we did with the moxifloxacin. So let's talk about these drugs. So ribavudin we had listed as a first-line drug, uh, but I included it here just simply to remind us that although it has the same or similar drug interactions and the same effect on the liver as for fampin, uh, it is about one-third of that intensity. So a lot of times, drug interactions that you can't overcome with rifampin, you can with rifibutin. And patients who have liver disease, a lot of times you can use rifibutin when you can't use rifampin. But it also has the advantage for us in that at this point, we know he's resistant to rifampin, but we're hoping on that 5% chance that he is sensitive to the rifibutin because it's very important to have a rifamycin on board as it's arguably our most potent drug. So the quinolones. Quinolones are the most important class of drugs we have in, to use in MDR patients. We're really up the creek when we develop XDR and we're no longer able to use the quinolones. There are four quinolone drugs that have been used for treating TB. None of them are approved for use in TB, however. The first one is ciprofloxacin. It was the first quinolone that we had available in the United States. It's a relatively weak drug against TB. It also has, of all, these drug, all the quinolones, it has the most drug interactions. Ofloxacin was next. Ofloxacin is the second generation quinolone and much more powerful than the ciprofloxacin. Levofloxacin is actually the active component of ofloxacin. Ofloxacin is a combination of a levo and a dextrorotary form of the molecule, but it's only the levofloxacin form that has activity against microorganisms. So when the patent ran out for ofloxacin, the manufacturer, very smartly, decided to come out on the market with levofloxacin, the active form. Then the fourth drug that we have available, and arguably the most potent against TB, is moxifloxacin, or Avalox. They are all bactericidal. They are all broad spectrum, so they are effective against a wide range of organisms and not just one or two. Now that's bad for us in TB because who is the patient we see most often with TB is the one that's been misdiagnosed for things like um, pneumonia or um, other conditions to which they will use a quinolone to treat it. And the patient will temporar temporarily get better because it's effective against TB and then eventually will relapse with resistance to the quinolones. And resistance to the quinolones apparently can occur pretty rapidly. So if you've got a patient that's just been diagnosed with TB and they have a history of being treated in the recent past uh, with a quinolone, be suspicious that there might be resistance to that organism. So it's expected serial levels and the dosing I have provided for you on a slide here. Uh, Oflox is 800 milligrams a day, Lebo is 750, and moxifloxacin is 400 milligrams a day. Now, you re will remember, of course, back when I get, showed you the regimen we placed him on, we placed him on moxifloxacin at 800 milligrams a day. And the reason for that higher dose 
is that when it's combined with erythromycin, the levels of moxifloxacin are reduced by 25 to 30 percent. So you need to increase the dose to somewhere between 600 and 800 milligrams. Unfortunately, it only comes in a 400 milligram tablet, so that makes the 600 milligrams more difficult to uh, utilize. So we went to the 800 milligrams per day. And the expected film concentrations are there for your reference. So adverse reactions from the quinolones, they can cause seizures, primarily in patients who are already predisposed to that. They frequently cause insomnia, so you may want to dose this earlier in the day rather than later in the day. And a tremor is not uncommon. It's it's same type of effect that you would get from drinking a lot of black coffee. So you get that caffeine type tremor with these drugs. It can also cause Stevens Johnson syndrome, which is potentially a fatal skin reaction. One of the more publicized adverse reactions is tendonitis or tendon rupture. And we've used an awful lot of the quinolones and we haven't seen a lot of it. it tends to occur more commonly in the elderly patients. Uh, cataracts and opacities with long term use. Quinolones, like many antibiotics, have been associated with pseudomembranous colitis. And it's also been associated with a premature closure of epiphyseal plates, which simply means that the long bones stop growing. And it's the reason why the quinolones are contraindicated in kids under the age of 18. Now, would you use it in a child that you needed to use it in because they had MDR, you were limited in drugs, it's important to treat? then absolutely. We've got a lot of experience with cystic fibrosis kids and the quinolones, and they do quite well with relatively few side effects. They do tend to come, end up with some more arthritic type conditions uh, and tendonitis than do adults. But at some point, I think we'll probably see that contraindication for use in kids eliminated. They can also cause phototoxicity, ciprofloxacin, being more likely to cause it than are the newer ones. But one of the more serious uh, adverse effects is QT prolongation, and particularly in patients who are on high doses, patients who have a predisposure to QT prolongation, or those that are on drugs that can also cause QT prolongation. Drug interactions, uh, antacids and the zinc and iron salts uh, and you could add calcium to that as well, will bind with the quinolones and prevent their absorption. So antacids should not be used within two hours before or after the quinolones. Cimetidine, which is tagamet, uh, can increase quinolone levels. Um, Rifibutin and moxie we already talked about, with the moxie having lower levels and the need to increase the dose of moxie. And ciprofloxacin, which we're rarely going to use, uh, has quite a few drug interactions that are important. The other class is aminoglycosides, and that includes streptomycin, amikacin, and canamycin. Now, capriomycin is a polypeptide antibiotic, not an aminoglycoside. However, it's dosed the same, it has the same side effects, you need to monitor the same things, so I'm lumping them all together here. They are bacteriocidal agents, they inhibit protein synthesis. They do not penetrate cells or caseous materials, so they only work extracellularly. So they will not get into the macrophage, for example. The dose, the package insert for streptomycin says for IM use only, as does the one for capriomycin. However, they can be successfully used IV when you need to. You put the dose in 100 milliliters of either normal saline or D5W and administer it, over, administer it over one hour, and patients do very well on it. As you are well aware, the aminoglycosides can hurt when they're injected, and we're going to have to use these drugs in our resistant patients for a long period of time. So it is better to go to IV if, if you have those facilities available to you. So the do dosing is the same. It's 15 mg per kilogram per day. We usually reduce the dose in those who have renal insufficiency because it is renally excreted, and that would include those that are over 60 years of age. And you don't need to give it daily. I see many programs using the aminoglycosides five days a week, and you really don't need to do that. 
three times a week is all that is necessary. You do need to adjust the dose downward in renal disease, but it's better to reduce the frequency than the size of the dose. So instead of giving it three times a week, you may give it twice a week, but at the same dose. And aminoglycosides are all contraindicated in pregnancy. Drug interactions, loop diuretics, that would be things like Lasix, furosemide, because they share the ability to cause uh, nephrotoxicity and also hearing toxicity, and the same is true for the penicillins and the cephalosporins. You're going to monitor the patients closely for renal function, for hearing, and vestibular function. We forget that one a lot. We'll, just, we'll say hearing and renal function, but they can also cause an unsteady gait, so you need to check for vestibular function as well. It can also cause peripheral pain and tingling. Streptomycin then was the first of these agents and was really one of our first TB drugs that was ever developed. It caused eighth nerve damage, ototoxicity vestibular about 16% of the time. And of all of the aminoglycosides, streptomycin is the least likely to cause nephrotoxicity with less than 2% requiring discontinuation. Amikacin and canamycin are the same drug. Amikacin gets converted to canamycin in the body. So essentially they're the same drug. So if they're resistant to canamycin, they're going to be resistant to amikacin as well. Uh, there does not seem to be a lot of cross-resistance between streptomycin, capriomycin, and canamycin. So that's a good thing for us because if they're resistant to strep and canamycin, you can still use capriomycin and so forth. So at least they don't share the same resistance pattern. Now here's, we got ototoxicity for canamycin, one and a half to 24 percent, and nephrotoxicity has now gone up to essentially four to nine percent. Then capriomycin, which we said is not really an aminoglycoside, but a bactericidal peptide antibiotic. It's dosed the same way, and nephrotoxicity has now gone up to 20 to 36 percent, and ototoxicity 11 percent. So it is potentially a more toxic agent than is either streptomycin or the canamycin. But it's an agent that we can certainly use as a valuable agent in those patients who have resistance to one of the, or both of the other drugs. Ethionamide uh, has trade name of either Tricator or Trecator, however you prefer to pronounce that. It's bacterial static, and it's related chemically to INH. So there is some crossover resistance. As we said, the INH aging will give low-level resistance to INH, but it also extends total resistance to ethionamide. So if you've got resistance to INH, you really want to know whether it's low or high. And if it's low, there's no point in substituting or adding ethionamide to the regimen. The dose is 250 milligrams, two to four times a day with food. And it is very irritating to the stomach. So the major side effects that we see with ethionamide or GI, patients simply don't tolerate it real well. Uh, get jaundice and hepatitis, uh, peripheral and optic neuritis. So because it's related to INH, you're going to see many of the same toxicities as you see with INH, but you're going to see them much more frequently. So it can cause psychosis. It can cause gynecomastia and impotence. And it can be teratogenic in high doses. So this is not a drug that you would choose to use in a patient who is pregnant. It can also cause a number of endocrine disturbances. Um, so you would want to keep an eye on things like thyroid level. Whoops, we're right back. Okay, so paramine salicylic acid. There we go. Paramine salicylic acid, or PASS, is bacteriostatic. Now, this is an interesting drug. It is actually an aspirin molecule that has had an amino radical placed on the para position of the molecule. So this is sort of an anti-aspirin, if you will. Um, it originally came as either a sodium or a potassium salt. It came as crystals, or it came at, that you used a scooper to measure out the dose, or it came as a tablet. 
But because they were sodium or potassium, you had to use a lot of caution with using PATS in patients who had CHF or hypertension. And the literature still gives you those cautions. However, what is available in the U.S. market right now is a product called PASER or PACER, P-A-S-E-R, which is a time-release formulation of the acid. So it doesn't have that potassium or the sodium, so we have less concerns in using it in patients with cardiovascular problems. It's a four-gram packet. It's a little envelope. And you open the packet, and you'll see little gelatin beads. And you sprinkle that on a soft food or in the beverage and have the patient eat it. Tell them not to chew it because if they chew it, they will break up those little gelatin things and they will get a immediate release formulation and that is very distressing to the GI tract. So soft, something like applesauce or pudding uh, or mix it in a little bit of a beverage, uh, preferably an acidic beverage or product. Uh, well, and you want to do it just before you give it. You don't want to put it in something and let it sit around because it will break down. So you need to keep it in the refrigerator. And if, ten, if heat or moisture gets to it, they turn out sort of a lavender or a brown color. And in that case, you know it's decomposing and you don't want to use that product any longer. Patients tolerate uh, uh, PASR much better than they did any of the older products. Adverse reactions, primarily GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, abdominal pain, not nearly as bad with these new formulations as with the older, older ones. However, diarrhea is fairly common, and it may be difficult to treat, and we'll talk a little bit later about how we go about treating it. But uh, patients, of all things, will complain about that the most. There's also a hypersensitivity reaction. Actually, there's two different syndromes of hypersensitivity. One involves fever, rash, leukopenia, and agranulocytosis, and the other one, thrombocytopenia, hepatitis, and encephalopathy. It will crystallize in the kidneys, so you need to make sure that the patient drinks plenty of fluids and stays well hydrated. Hepatitis also occurs with this, and for whatever reason, seems to be more common in diabetics. It can cause B12 depletion, so you might want to consider supplementing their diet with B12. Cyclosurine, then, is a very useful drug. Uh, it's ceramycin is the brand name. And uh, it's bacteriostatic. And the dose is deceptive. If you read the literature in the package insert, it will tell you to start with a dose of 500 milligrams once a day and increase gradually to a total dose of one gram a day in divided doses. We here at Holly do not feel that you need to use that high a dose. And if you're using 750 to 1,000 milligrams a day of cyclosamine, we will almost guarantee your patient will become psychotic. If you remember the pictures in the movies of patients back in the early days of TB and they all looked very happy in the sanitariums, it's because they were psychotic on cyclosamine. And it can occur even at the low doses of 250 milligrams once or twice a day that we use here. And usually starts out by being reported by a roommate as the patient suddenly acting a little squirrely, they're agitated, they're um, irritable, uh, and then it can go on from there to become a full psychotic episode. So you need to watch it. But it is a very useful drug because it does cross the blood-brain barrier. And if you've got a patient with TB meningitis, then this is a good, good drug to have on board. So side effects are primarily CNS. Convulsions, seizures in those patients who have a tendency towards that, a tremor, confusion, uh, aggressiveness, or psychosis. There is an allergic dermatitis, which occurs, which I've never seen. There is a narrow therapeutic range. Uh, and we increase the dose of vitamin B6 to 200 milligrams once a day when we place the patient on cycloserine. Because just like INH, B6 seems to be the antidote to the neurotoxicities that you get with the drug. But we use the higher dose of 200 milligrams instead of the 25 to 50 that we would use in the patient as just on INH. And you want to monitor serum levels, renal function, and watch for CNS side effects. 
There are other agents that we can use. Clofazamine has been around for a long time. It's used actively for treating leprosy, uh, and it does have some marginal use in patients who have resistant forms of TB. It's difficult to get. It was taken off of the U.S. market a number of years ago. The only way you can get it is going through the FDA and getting an individual patient treatment uh, IND number. And what you have to do is you have to submit the case of the patient that you want to place on clofazamine to the FDA. They have a form for this. Uh, you also have to go have a protocol. You have to have an informed consent for the patient. You have to go through an IRB. So you have to go through all those hoops. But once you do that, it usually gets approved, and the drug is provided out of the Hansen Center in Louisiana at no charge. So the trade name is Lamprene. It is bacterial cidal. Uh, the dose for TB is 200 milligrams once a day. It has a very long half-life of 70 days. So once you get an adverse reaction, it's likely to stick around for a long time. So crystal deposits in gut, liver, gallbladder can occur, and it's skin pigmentation. We refer to it as the glofazamine suntan. But you can take a patient who is very blonde and light skin and turn their skin to a very dark brown color. It has sort of a reddish tinge to it. If you've ever seen a clofazamine suntan, you would recognize it. It can cause skin dryness and itching. And just like rifampin discolors the urine and the sweat, uh, orange or red, clofazamine will turn it into a sort of a tannish color. The carbapenems, then, are a class of antibiotics, again, not approved for use in TB. The one that we use the most is imipenem or primaxin. You could also use Mirum. They are IV only. We use it for primaxin. We treat it 1,500 milligrams twice a day, given over two hours, IV only. Um, if the patient complains of GI upset or headaches or dizziness while you're administering it, you can overcome that by extending the length of the infusion to two and a half to three hours. Uh, it's generally used in combination with aminoglycoside, either amikacin or capriomycin, and we would keep it on board for at least six months post-conversion uh, to culture negative. There is a cross-hypersensitivity with penicillins and cephalosporins, so you would want to use caution in a patient with a history of penicillin and allergies, and you're going to monitor renal function. So adverse reactions from the cover panels would be seizures, primarily at high doses or if you administer it too rapidly, nephrotoxicity, and rash. Usually our patients tolerate them very well. We haven't had many problems at all using the Primax and other than keeping the IV in for such an extended period of time. Linezolid is the newest agent, again, not approved for treating TB, but very, very effective in treating your more extensively resistant forms of TB. The trade name is Zybox. It's bactericidal. Its primary use in medicine is in treating MRSA infections. It has a number of serious adverse reactions. Lactic acidosis is one. Myelosuppression occurs in almost every patient who takes it for more than uh, two to three weeks, thrombocytopenia, leukopenia, pancytopenia, and also can cause a peripheral or optic neuropathy. And it may be reversible, uh, but it may be reversible if you discover it quickly, but if you don't discover it and continue treatment, it can lead to blindness. So you would want to be warning the patients about checking for any changes in their vision. Uh, it has moderate MAOI, monoamine oxidase inhibitor activity. And you remember the old class of MAOI antidepressant drugs, which we no longer use because of all of their drug interaction and food drug interactions. So this shares many of those. So you would want to use extreme caution if you use linezolid in combination with antidepressants, drugs used for hypertension, decongestant drugs such as pseudoephedrine or phenylephrine. So you would want to warn the patient not to use over-the-counter cough cold decongestant products. 
Also pain medications such as mepiridine and dilaudid, flexeril, which is a muscle relaxant, or tramadol, can cause a serotonin syndrome, which uh, can be quite serious, um, involves agitation, confusion, hallucination, shivering, tachycardia, hyperreflexia, and even hypertensive crisis. So you want to be cautious with the patient in this and warn them about foods that contain serotonin and tyramine. And those would be things like Chianti wines, aged cheeses, pickles, sauerkraut, soy sauce, bananas, avocados, and pickled fish or meats. Not every patient will get those interactions, but they are quite common in patients who do uh, use linezolid. Now, what we use in linezolid for a dose is controversial. We haven't really determined what the appropriate dose is. The standard dose for treating MRSA would be 600 milligrams twice a day. However, for treating uh, TB, we usually use, whoops, I'm sorry, these slides just aren't coming up the way they should here. Um, So <clears throat> the dose for TB, we don't know what it is. We've tried everything from 300 milligrams once a day up to the full 1,200 milligrams in divided doses. We're currently using 600 milligrams. That's the size tablet that it comes in is 600 milligrams. But we're looking for references to see that we can use lower doses. There are a number of trials going on around the United States and in other countries trying to determine the appropriate dose. So back to our case. Back on January 11th of 08, he received the following report from a specimen that we submitted in October. And we confirmed it by two labs. Remember I said you want to confirm your uh, sensitivities when you're dealing with high levels of resistance. So you'll see here that two labs now say that he is resistant to strep. Isonize it at 0.1 and 0.4. Rifampin at 2 the Thambutal at 2.5. The PCA was still pending from one lab, but was resistant by the other lab. INH at 2, so at the higher concentration, they're sensitive. So it's probable that by going to the 900 milligram two or three times a week dose, instead of using the daily 300, we were able to overcome that particular resistance. But we're not going to count INH as an active drug. He's resistant to ethionamide, so that, that again, backs up the fact that low-level INH resistance confers total resistance to ethionamide. Streptomycin was pending, as was ethambutol at 7.5. Resistant to canamycin at 5, and remember, that's also going to make him resistant to amicacin. Sensitive to clofazamine at 0 0.5, resistant to caprio at 1.25, Resistant to rifabutin at point five, so our attempt to use the rifabutin instead of rifampin was not successful here. And he is resistant to ofloxacin, a quinolone, at two. So now he's qualified for XDR and beyond. He is essentially resistant to all of our drugs. And this indicates the different places that we submitted samples. We got two samples here. Uh, from the Florida State Lab, we got one from Focus, we got one from National Jewish Center in Denver, and we got one from CDC. And one of the interesting things when you start getting multiple results is that they all don't test for the same drugs at the same level. So you can see that INH at one was tested by National Jewish, but none of the other centers tested at that level except for CDC. And you'll see that occurring several different places along here. Now, one of the interesting things about CDC's responses is they give you a percentage of resistance. So if you look all the way over to the right to CDC's resistance patterns, you'll see INH is one. It shows it 100% resistant. Uh, rifampin, 100%. But rifibutin at two was tw only 25% resistant. Uh, Ethambutol, whoops. 
at Fan Utah, we were also resistant here at 25%. So it's it's nice to see these percentages because that tells you that a percentage of the population of the organisms in the drug are still sensitive to the drug that we want to use. So now that we have all these new resistances, what regimen would you like to place the patient on? So if you want to poll on this, stop everything and put him on amikacin and clofazamine and cyclosamine. Keep him on everything but add amikacin, clofazamine, and linezolid. Stop everything and put him on PZA, cyclosamine, and linezolid. I have no idea. Send him back to Peru or none of the above. You guys remember how to build out there? We got one in here. There, we're coming in. Okay, we've got several I have no ideas, and we're kind of with you on that. I will say that uh, our state office would have preferred for us to send him back to Peru, but at this point, he's got M at least MDR, and he has positive cultures and sputums, and you can't put him on a plane uh, in, under those conditions. So what did we do from here? So once the susceptibilities return, we used the following. We placed him on linezolid, 600 milligrams daily, so we added that. We placed him on PASS, 4 grams, twice a day. We did serum levels. They were low, so we eventually increased that to three times a day. And I didn't mention, but probably should have, that PASS should be given with food because of the GI upset. Clofazamine, 200 milligrams daily. Cycloserine, we did levels. We started out 250 milligrams once a day, but we did levels and they were slightly low, so we increased them to alternating 250 milligrams one day and 500 the next. The Moxie was good at 800. We had him on the Prime Maxin, we had him on Caprio three times a week, and we had him on the high dose 200 milligrams of vitamin B6. Now, from this chart over on the left, you'll see that the critical concentrations are listed there under the drugs. So those were the levels at which they were tested. And we did serum levels, so we did a level of two hours. And two hours will give you the peak concentration of most of the TB drugs. The exceptions to that are rifibutin, which is three hours, and PASS, which is six hours. So you'll see that we just have a six-hour level here of 46.3. And the expected literature peak is between 10 and 60, so we're right in the middle. And you see the patient was resistant at 2 and sensitive at 6. So if the patient was sensitive at 6 micrograms per milliliter of pass, we were well above that at 46.3. Linezolid, 600 milligrams once a day. He, the culture showed that he was sensitive at 2. Our two-hour level was 2.6, and our six-hour was 10.15, so he was delayed absorber on this, and we were within acceptable ranges here. Capriomycin, one gram three times a week, expected to be 35 to 45, and he reached 41.71. So you will see that we maximized our doses to get concentrations that were sufficiently above our... Um, sensitivity levels. And remember, you want to be somewhere between 4 and 16 times the MIC. So if you have a patient you're treating for total drug resistance, it requires close monitoring for adverse reactions, which includes their blood counts, metabolic panels, uh, that should be LFTs, not TFTs, renal and hepatic function, audiometry, vestibular function, peripheral neuropathy, color and visual acuity, and psychiatric condition. And we need to treat the symptoms. They're going to be on these drugs for a long time because remember we're treating 18 to 24 months here with very toxic agents. So some of the symptoms they might get would be gout, joint pain, muscle pains, for which you can use things like allopurinol, colchicin, probenicid, and frequently just NSAIDs will overcome a lot of the muscle aches and pains. Insomnia from the quinolones. You could use hydroxyzine, which is Vistaril or Atarax. Use Benadryl, you can use Trazodone. Peripheral neuropathy, you can use B6. Now, the peripheral neuropathies that you get from the linezolid, you cannot overcome with B6. B6 
is effective for INH and for the toxicities we see from ethionamide or from cyclosurine, but not for treating linezolids. Gabapentin is good for treating the peripheral neuropathies as well, and it's effective on all of them. GI intolerance, extremely common in these patients. So you may have to give the medications after meals, although we don't normally recommend that. Remember, two hours after breakfast is not the same thing as an empty stomach after drinking your dinner the night before and not having breakfast. So, you know, inquire with the patients as to when they ate the last meal. You can try pre-medicating. 30 minutes before you give the TB meds, you can give something like metoclopramide, which is Reglan, 5 to 10 milligrams. You can give promethazine, 25 milligrams. Hydroxyzine, 25 to 50 milligrams. Lorazepam, uh, it's not our first line choice, but it would be a drug that we would go to if we needed to, 0.5 to 1 milligram. Or the more expensive agents, such as ondansetron which have, we have rarely had to resort to. Uh, diarrhea, very common with PATH. You can try over-the-counter things like Imodium. Uh, you could use Lomotil, but frequently we end up having to go to tincture of opium. And tincture of opium with six drops uh, given two to three times a day is usually quite effective for that. Itching, uh, diphenhydramine, whoops, oh no. Guys, there we go. I just lost the entire screen. Uh-oh. I don't know what you guys have up, but I can't get. Guys, I just lost all the slides. Anyone there? Jerry Jean, I'm on here. This is Julia. I will um I'll be contacting Donna real quick. Okay. Hey, Hi. I'm Jerry Jean. It is Donna. Um we are seeing everything, so if you want to continue and I could advance your slides for you. Perfect, because I don't have anything here on the screen right now. Okay. And I unfortunately I have a hard copy. Okay, so we are on um ADR with the diarrhea and itching. Right. And are you ready for the next screen? Just one second. Um, yes, I am ready for the next okay. screen. So, okay. um, then That's my cat watching football. Okay. But unfortunately, we lost the game. Uh, so who should have TDM? We're going to do therapeutic drug monitoring on patients who seem to be failing treatment. We want to make sure that we're maximizing the doses for the patients because we really need those higher levels in these more resistant cases. We're going to do levels on patients with possible toxic side effects to see if we need to reduce the dose. Patients with renal or hepatic problems we're going to check on because the levels of the drugs can be moderated by either renal insufficiency or by hepatic dysfunction. And of the two, renal dysfunction tends to be the more serious. Or if we have drug interactions, we're suspecting interferes with our drug. And it's a very, very expensive way of doing compliance checks, and I don't really recommend that. So next, TB drug levels, how do you do that? Put the patient on the dose of the drug for at least two weeks before you attempt to do any drug levels. So they should be on a steady regimen and a steady dose for at least two weeks. So everything gets leveled out, and you know where you're going. Ideally, it should be done at the same time and the way the patient normally takes the drug. You're going to draw two levels. Now, a lot of places will only recommend one level, but we suggest two levels because the second level will pick up those patients who are delayed absorbers and prevents you from accidentally overdosing the patient because you reacted to a low uh, two-hour level. So the peak level is normally at two hours for most drugs, and then we do a pseudotrop to six hours as a check. Next. Um, you need at least one milliliter per drug per level. You use a red top tube, spin, separate, freeze. You ship it frozen to whatever lab you're using. And you can usually get the results back in about two weeks. And the next slide simply gives you a reference slide on the different drugs, the expected peak levels, three to four.
for instance, INH 3 to 5 micrograms per milliliter is the concentration you expect after a 300 milligram dose. And for the 900 milligram dose we're using in this patient, it would be greater than 10, in the 10 to 15 range. And then the far right gives you the MIC. And remember, you'd like to be at least 4 to 16 times the MIC. So how long would you treat our patient? And you want to vote on this, and your choices are one year, two years, one year after culture conversion, 18 months after culture conversion, or two years after culture conversion. So, Jerry Jean, we've got, oh, God, we've got about eight responses now. Uh, well, it's even, this one you've gotten a lot of responses on. Let's see, we've got, um, most people are saying 18 months after culture conversion. They were listening. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is correct. Oh, I got my screen back. Okay, yes. So 18 months after culture conversion is correct. So that's how long you're going to want to uh, treat this patient. So the patient completed therapy on July 3rd uh, of 09, which was 18 months after he converted to culture negative. The patient was smear and culture negative since January 3rd of 08. He's denied any adverse effects. The patient was mostly taking his drugs. We got a few levels that were aberrant, so he probably was not taking that particular dose on that day. We do surprise levels. We don't tell anybody, including the nurses, when we're going to do them. We just walk in the room and take the level. And uh, so he was mostly taking his medications. He was a typical 20-year-old and not uh, being real cooperative. So that is essentially our case. We do have a follow-up on him. He has now been more than two years post-treatment. He is doing well. He's back in Peru, and he has no signs of TB, and he's very happy to be home. So I'd be glad to answer any questions that you all may have today. Ladies and gentlemen, over the phone line, if you'd like to register for a question, Please press the 1, followed by the 4, on your telephone keypad. Press the 1, followed by the 4. Thank you. Okay, this is Julia. Um, I'm just going to ask you a question here, Jerry Jean, and I thank you. This has been very, very good, um, very helpful. Um, I'm just going to back up a little bit in that scenario that uh, you were talking about in the very beginning where you had increased his B6 to 200 milligrams. Um, you said you were going to touch on that a little bit later, and I believe I caught where um, you were saying that you increased it because of he would put him on cyclosterine in the beginning. That is correct. When you place the patient on cyclosterine, you can use 200 milligrams of B6 as an antidote to the neurotoxicity that patients frequently get from us. Okay, great. Now, you want to use caution if the patient has renal insufficiency uh, because contrary to what we used to think, B6 can accumulate in the body. Uh, but 100 to 200 milligrams, uh, almost all patients, despite their renal function, will handle very well. Okay. Well, that's one of the big issues are going to be the, the food, drug interactions, and the toxicities. By the time you get a month out in treatment with linezolid, even at 600 milligrams, almost all patients are going to have some um, effects on their blood, um, and many of them will get some rather bizarre neuropathies. We had a patient who was tasting colors which was very interesting. So green would have one taste to it, and purple would have a different taste to it. But it uh, doesn't look like B6 is very effective against any of those toxicities. Okay, thank you. Very, very good information there. Um, 
Another question that I have, um, and I just missed a little bit of what you were saying, I'm, I'm afraid, probably. When you were talking early on about uh, the resistance and primary resistance and then the secondary resistance, mm -hmm. you mentioned something about you were able to overcome some of the resistance by increasing the dose, but then I thought I heard you say something about secondary resistance you weren't able to no, overcome as easily. No, secondary resistance is how you acquire the level of resistance. Exactly, yeah. So, and actually, if you if you start out with sensitive PB and you were noncompliant, which is the most common cause of drug resistance, or we weren't giving you adequate doses, and you, or your body wasn't absorbing the drugs appropriately, and you developed resistance while we were treating you, that would be secondary resistance. Now, if you caught a resistant strain, as this kid probably did, from someone else, for you it may be primary resistance. So it's, it's, where, it's a, where you get the resistance, not how hard it is to treat the resistance. So if you have low-level resistance to INH, or if you have a Thambutol or Streptomycin, by increasing the dosage of those drugs, you can usually overcome the low-level resistance. That's why we tested it at two or three different levels. and you know, adjust to the dose appropriately to be above that MIC. Rifampin is all or nothing. It's because of the mechanism of what the RPOB gene modification does. It changes the way the, drug, the bug handles the drug, and it doesn't matter what dose you give, you're not going to be able to overcome it. Okay, great. Thank you. Do we have any other questions out there? As a reminder, to register for a question, please press the 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone keypad. And there are no questions over the phone at this time. Thank you. Okay, let me see. We have another question in. Okay, this we want uh, this person would like to know, do you have many cases uh you remember they remember using PAS ETH now ETA and cyclosyrene once in 19 years. <laughs> um well, I think we use it a lot more than that. We try not to use ethionamide. Uh, because of all the GI issues we have with it. But we use a lot of cyclosterine. We use cyclosterine in patients who are pan-sensitive who have CNS TB because it crosses the blood-brain barrier, so that gives us another very active drug where not all drugs cross into that. So we use cyclosterine a lot. We usually run somewhere in the vicinity of, um, here at the hospital now, of about 30% of our patients being MDR, or XDR. So we use a lot of the second-line drugs. We use, at any given time, we probably have one or two patients on PATH. We probably have a half a dozen or more on cyclosterine. Ethionamide, rarely. Um, linezolid, um, we don't use that much linezolid, but we probably have one or two patients a year that won't we'll need to use linezolid on. The quinolones we use a lot. Okay. And one of the one of the differentiations about the quinolones would be that if you have a patient who has severe hepatitis where you're having trouble using drugs, levofloxacin is a good drug to use because it's renally excreted and it has very minimal effect on the liver. Moxifloxacin is a more potent agent but it has mixed metabolism. And for moxifloxacin, sometimes the patients will not tolerate it as well if they have liver problems. On the other hand, you don't have to adjust the dose of moxifloxacin in patients with renal insufficiency, and you do need to reduce the dose of the levofloxacin. So that, that would be a differentiation there as to when to use levo or when to use the moxifloxacin. Okay, thank you very much. And um, Jerry Jean, we have another question here. 
that ask, um, what was the total duration of this patient's hospital stay? How was he monitored after discharge? Okay, he stayed here until cure, so we had him here for approximately two years. And he was discharged off of all drugs back to his community. Now, one of the reasons why we couldn't send him back to uh, Peru, besides you know getting on an airplane with active TB, was that they could not get the drugs for him back in Peru. They did not have access to some of the twin loans. They did not have access to the linezolid. Uh, so there's no way that they could have treated this patient back in Peru. And just as sort of an aside, since we have a few minutes here, several years before this case of this kid, um, we were doing some telephone conferences with the National Health Service in Peru, their TB program, because they had had an outbreak of MDR TB among their pilots, and they were asking for our consultation from us, and we managed to work them through that. But we were having, like, monthly phone calls. So one day they said they wanted to present this case of a young girl to us. And the young girl was from Lima, and she was resistant, had a resistance pattern almost identical to this kid. Uh, and they, we told them what we thought that they should do, and they said, well, we can't get those drugs. Can you send us the drugs? Well, of course we couldn't do that. So we asked them, well, you know, what are you going to do? They said, well, we're not going to do anything. We said, well, where is she? Is she in a hospital or, you know, staying at home or what? He said, oh, no, she's going to school. Oh, my goodness. So here was a girl with, she was like 13 or 14. She had multi-multi-drug resistant TB, and she was actively going to school. And it was in the same community that this kid was in, our patient, and we suspect that he may have been going to school with her. We don't know whatever happened to her, but we suspect she probably didn't make it. Wow, that, that's sad, um, very sad if, if she was not treated and, you know, of course, did not make it. Um, but very interesting regarding this fellow and how he may have um, acquired the MDR or XDR TB. Yep. We're very lucky in this country to have access to the drugs that we do. Yes. Let's, and, you know, one of the big side effects of linezolid is its cost because at even – 600 milligrams for one tablet daily, a month supply costs a little over $2,600 for that one drug. So cost is certainly a significant factor in treating these secondary cases. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask um, one more time here. Do we have other questions out there? And as a reminder, to register for any questions, please press 1, followed by the 4 on your telephone keypad. Please press 1, 4. Thank you. And there seems to be no question at this time. I will turn it back to you. Thank you. Um, Jerry Jean, I do have one question for you. I'm afraid it does not really relate uh, completely to this uh, today. Um, but I know you all deal, uh, just like this fellow who was from Peru, you all um, see many patients that are from outside of the United States, and you use interpreters and have many inf a lot of information there in different languages. We are looking for some m information on the uh, first-line drugs for TB in the actual Burmese language. Hmm. Um, we've looked on several sites and found it in, the, in Karin and Karin I, or how are you, I'm not exactly certain on how to say the next, um, say that other language that they use there. I uh, was just wondering if you had any knowledge of. Well, we haven't had to use Burmese, but I will take a look, Julia, and let you know if I've got anything. Okay. One of the... Um, Drug information programs that we have um, will print in like 26, 36 different languages. So if nothing else, perhaps we can at least get some of the drug information for you in that language. Okay. Thank I'll you. Look it up and see what we can do. All right. Well, it uh, looks like we are 
we do not have any further questions at this time. And again, I would just want to thank uh, Jerry Jean Stanbaugh from AG Holly Hospital for presenting this today. This was very, very informative, and uh, we thank you for uh, taking your time to do both of these presentations for us. Uh, we really appreciate that. And I also want to thank SNTC for coordinating all this and uh, getting it together. Thank you, Donna. And um, at this time, we will close. And okay, thank you, Julie. Appreciate doing, you're asking me to do this, and I apologize for some of the slowness with the slides. I think it all went well. Thank you very much. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participations, and we ask that you please disconnect your lines, and have a great day, everyone.